In this session, we're going to talk about the evolution of the eye. In fact, when it comes to evolution, the eyes don't have it. One thing I've run into a lot over the last 20, 25 years is I've been seriously involved in creation ministry. It's more times than I can count. I've had people approach me and say, well, doesn't the eye prove that evolution has occurred? And in so much of the material and so many of the videos and so much of, of, the, of the literature that I've reviewed over the years, the evolution of the eyes presented is fact. This is something the secular world, the materialists, the evolutionists, we know how this happened. This is proof of evolution. Proverbs 2012, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. And a verse you're going to see a lot during this presentation, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. In the beginning, life was blind. This is what our world looked like four billion years ago, before there were any eyes to see, until... A few hundred million years passed, and then one day, there was a microscopic copying error in the DNA of a bacterium. This random mutation gave that microbe a protein molecule that absorbed sunlight. Want to know what the world looked like to a light-sensitive bacterium? Take a look at the right side of the screen. Mutations continued to occur at random, as they always do in any population of living things. Another mutation caused a dark bacterium to flee intense light. What is going on here? Night and day. Those bacteria that could tell light from dark had a decisive advantage over the ones that couldn't. Why? Because the daytime brought harsh ultraviolet light that damages DNA. The sensitive bacteria fled the intense light to safely exchange their DNA in the dark. They survived in greater numbers than the bacteria that stayed at the surface. Over time, those light-sensitive proteins became concentrated in a pigment spot on the more advanced one-celled organism. This made it possible to find the light. Okay, if you're paying attention to this, you've got to be really confused right about now. Well, first of all, this is all presented as fact. And I find it really fascinating that somehow they know what the world looked like to a bacteria billions of years ago. I mean, sometimes my eyesight is so bad, I can't tell you what the world looks like today. But, you know, I can sort of see your face. But the point is, you know, you've got these bacteria, and then there's a mutation, and somehow they develop this light-sensitive spot. And because they can sense light, the ones that have this sensitivity can flee the light because the light's bad. The ones that can't flee the light stay near the surface and the sun causes mutations in the DNA that don't reproduce as well. But as this process improves and becomes more complex over time, later these same bacteria, because the eye spot area is more advanced, they're now able to seek the light. Well, before the spot caused them to go away, I, I don't understand. During this week's episode, Tyson discussed the evolution of the eye. Something creationists have said for years that evolution cannot explain in attempting to use as evidence that life must be intelligently designed. Tyson eloquently explained how the eye evolved and how well scientists understand this evolution. Tyson touched on how many species have evolved an eye, but did leave out the fact that there are over 40 known independent eye evolutions, something that very clearly discredits any intelligent design. So one of the ideas, one of the concepts over the years for the evolutionists, you look at all the different varieties of eyes and all these living creatures, you know, all these different, it's an amazing, it's an enormous variety in the types of eyes that, that organisms have. The evolutionists have hypothesized that the eye has evolved 40 different times or more randomly in certain creatures. Now think of that. A complex structure like that has evolved over 40 different times. Now, another thing that I hear a lot in creation circles, and I hear this stuff in church a lot, well, Charles Darwin said the eye disproved evolution. Actually, he didn't say that. This is what he said. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for emitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, that's true. 
Because all those things are true. The eye is enormously, it's unimaginably almost complex. And he said to see that this occurred by natural, it does seem absurd. Did he reject the theory? Not at all. If further the eye ever varies and the variations be inherited, as is likewise certainly the case, and if such variations should be useful to any animal under changing conditions of life, then the difficulty of believing that a perfect and complex eye could be formed by natural selection, though insuperable by our imagination, should not be considered as subversive of the theory. Basically, this thing is amazingly, it's incredibly, it's enormously complex, but it happened. Okay. This is a letter he wrote to a Harvard professor named Asa Gray. I will just run through some of the points in your letter. What you say about my book gratifies me most deeply, and I wish I could feel all was deserved by me. I quite think a review from a man who is not an entire convert, if fair and moderately favorable, is in all respects the best kind of review. About the weak points, I agree. The eye to this day gives me a cold shudder. But when I think of the fine known gradations, my reason tells me I ought to conquer the coal shutter. In other words, it's enormously complex. I have trouble, you know, really imagining how natural selection could be the, the, the process that allowed this to happen. But my reason tells me I need to get over that and accept it. You know why? There's no God that cares. There is no creator. These things ultimately created themselves. Psalm 14, 1, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Since the time of Darwin, many evolutionary biologists have wrestled with the question of eye evolution. From an anatomical point of view, researchers have discovered many different types of eyes. For example, the eyes of fruit flies, squid, and humans are quite different from each other. This observation has led evolutionary biologists to propose that eyes may have independently arisen multiple times during evolution. Based solely on morphology, such a hypothesis seems reasonable and for many years was accepted by the scientific community. As, as ridiculous, at least to some people, as that seems, the eye has evolved over 40 different times and that was accepted and still is accepted in certain groups, in certain, you know, in certain segments of the evolutionary community. In their seminal paper of 1970, in, other words, in this very important landmark paper of 1977, Salvini, Plowin, and Mayer compared overall structure, photoreceptor types, developmental origins of eye tissue, position of receptor axons, and other anatomical markers among eyes. Based on this analysis, they conclude that the eye evolved not once, but at least 40 different times and possibly more. But at the same time, they know this happened. And I've been told so many times by college professors and teachers and anatomists as I've traveled, they know this happened. This is proof of evolution. You know, and the thing is, eyes can be relatively simple. We've got pinhole types of eyes. We've got concave mirror types of eyes. We've got camera eyes. But the thing is, eyes can be quite complex. And the things, we have what's called apposition compound eyes and ants and wasps and dragonflies and apoposition neural superposition compound. Say that five times without, you know, getting tongue tied. And some flies have that refraction superposition compound. Some of these are just amazingly complex. Some are relatively simple. But there's an enormous variety of eyes. Look at the eyes you find in this relatively simple creature. There are different types of trilobite eyes. That sure looks simple to me, right? I mean, that's a very complex structure in a relatively simple creature. Now, when I say relatively simple, I mean relatively simple compared to, say, a mammal or something. But trilobites have very complex eyes, even in relatively simple creatures. Over time, simple eyes evolved into more complex types of eyes by modifications that resulted in the addition of more, of, addition of more types of cells, such as lens cells and nerve cells. Future research will be needed to resolve this controversy. So this is how you go from simple eyes to more complex eyes. You add things like lens cells and nerve cells. Simple, right? That's called proof. Actually, that's called necessity. To go from a simple eye to a more complex eye, you have to add these more complex structures. And they were just added. Intelligent design proponents say the eye is too complex. 
it could not have evolved. Science says, look at the evidence. Scientists like me see uh, complex structures like the eye having arisen from natural processes through small individual steps rather than from a single large step. Mollusks show an interesting series of developments that probably also represent stages in the evolution of the vertebrate eye. First, you get a light-sensitive row of cells. And that has an advantage, because that at least lets you tell light from dark, and that's important for some biochemical processes. Next, you have another mollusk that has basically a cupped structure, where the cells are inside of a basin. And that allows you to tell which direction the light is coming from. That's an advantage over just being able to tell light from dark, so that could be selected for. Next along the line, you have basically the equivalent of a pinhole camera, where primitive focusing becomes possible. Next comes the evolution of a primitive lens, which again is another improvement in the ability to focus an image. And finally, you have a very complex structure with a very good lens, which is able to focus light very effectively on the back of the eye and thus transmit a lot more information to the brain. So what we have is they're looking at mollusks, all the different types of eyes and mollusks. You go from relatively simple to somewhat more complex to more complex. Now listen to what she said, and this is a phrase, this is a concept that's gonna come up a lot during this presentation. You start with some light sensitive cells. How do cells become light sensitive? Well, we start there. We don't wanna deal with that. We're gonna start with these light sensitive cells. Of course, then how when these cells sense light, it causes a reaction in the creature. We're not going to deal with that either. We're going to start with some light-sensitive cells. And then over time, you get the cupping, you get the lens that shows up. You get so, but, And see, all these, all these structures just happen to, to, to sort of appear out of nothing. But if you look at the different eyes they're talking about, and we'll see this chart as we go along, you go from simple to slightly more complex to more complex to more complex. You know what all the eyes we're going to see are? They're fully functional. They all do exactly what they were designed to do. But we go back to start with some light-sensitive cells. And when I actually downloaded this video some months ago, I don't like to read the comments that people leave on the Internet because you just, you know, sometimes you just get bogged down in this. But one did catch my eye. Even if I wasn't a Christian, I couldn't believe such a contrived load of rubbish that this lady's discussing. First, you get some light-sensitive cells. And they call this science? Yeah, as a matter of fact, they do. You go from simple to more complex to more. But all five of those eyes, though, you know, you've got this variety of complexity in mollusks. All those eyes are functional. Scientists not only see evidence of evolution in the increasing complexity of mollusk eye development, they see it even in our own development. The eyes of a human fetus grow increasingly complex in stages, just as the eyes of mollusks have over thousands of years. First of all, you get basically a light-sensitive patch, and then you get a cup-like form that eventually forms a whole lens and a full eye with all the nerves and all the connections bringing light to the brain and so forth, and then the, the baby is born and then you can see. If it can grow, it can evolve. A very similar process produces an eye in an organism that's, that's born, like you or me, is a process that took place over millions of years across scores of different uh, lineages of, of evolving organisms. What this shows is a complex structure like the eye can develop through many small steps from something simpler. And this is how Darwinian evolution works. Well, I could only come up with about five one-hour lectures just off that one video alone. First of all, comparing the development of an eye in a fetus to the range of complexities of eyes in the mollusks is ridiculous. Because when the egg is fertilized, that, that child is gonna, that's going to have that eye as it develops, that, 
the, the eye is coded for. It has to go through the de developmental stages because you start off with two cells and four cells and eight cells. I mean, you've got to develop. That's just, it's ridiculous to compare embryologic development to supposed evolutionary progression in mollusks. And then my favorite part is, and then the baby's born and it can see. It's like, oh yeah, the baby's born and it can see. It's un unimaginably complex. But just because you line up things to simple to more complex, they call that proof. Okay, let's call that proof. How do you prove this? This is a fish that basically has bifocals. It has two eyes in one. It has two corneas and two retinas. One is designed to see underwater. The other is designed to see at the surface. Now, how can you possibly explain? Basically, the, the creature's got four eyes. Each eye has two different eyes. How, how, what's the evolutionary explanation for that? There's no other creature that I'm aware of that does that. But they just know it happened. Eyes of some sort occur in most animal phyla, but their construction and ontogeny vary enormously. One distinction is between eyes with photoreceptor cells that differentiate from the central nervous system and those with photoreceptor cells that differentiate from the epidermis. The vertebrate eyes, the former kind, and the cephalopod and arthropod eyes are from the latter. In other words, as you look at the different varieties of eyes, different kinds of eyes evolve from different kinds of basic tissue. But again, the evolutionists just know they evolved. Different optical types of eye, simple versus compound, also, of course, require fundamentally different developmental programs. Even eyes of the same type often show fundamental differences, such as the retina being inverse, where the photoreceptors face the back of the eye, and ever, which occurs in vertebrates, and everse, where the photoreceptors face the front of the eye, and cephalopods. And this is a very important point, the direction that the, that the photoreceptors actually point. The situation took a dramatic turn when geneticists began to study eye development. Researchers identified a master control gene. They call it the PAX6 gene. The protein encoded by the PAX6 gene is a transcription factor that controls the expression of many other genes, including those involved in the development of the eye in both rodents and humans. In other words, they were looking at the genome, and they said, wow, we found this master control gene. This switches things on and off as far as eye development is concerned. Now, when they take a mouse PAC6 control gene, they can actually switch on eye formation in Drosophila, which is, a, which is a, like a fruit fly. PAC6 gene actually turns on eye development in the fruit fly. But you know what kind of eye the fruit fly develops? A fruit fly eye. You can say that really fast, right? A fruit fly. That's better than that position compound neuro. Yeah, a fruit fly. So the mouse master control gene turns on eye development of fruit fly, and you get a fruit fly. Well, who'd have guessed, right? <laughs> Since the discovery of the PAC6 gene and the eyeless genes, homologs of this gene have been discovered in many different species. In all cases where it's been tested, the gene is involved with eye development. Gearing and colleagues have hypothesized that the eyes of many different species have evolved from a common ancestral form consisting of, as Darwin proposed, one photoreceptor cell and one pigment cell. In other words, as they found this gene, now they're saying, well, everything sort of has a common developmental pathway. Well, it seems like before they were talking about the eye developed 40 different ways in 40 different you know, lineages, if you will, or more, but now they're saying, no, because of this gene we found, it only occurred once, and it sort of varied over all these different varieties of creatures. Recently, the multiple origins hypothesis based on morphological evidence has been challenged by results from molecular experiments. Specifically, Gehrig and Ico proposed that because a single well-conserved master gene, which is that PAC6 gene, can initiate eye construction in diverse species, eyes must have arisen from a single ancestor. So here we have two different schools of thought. It happened more than 40 times. Everything goes back to a single ancestor. But at the same time, this is presented as fact. We know this happened. We even know how it happened. Because you'll notice these other scientists, they've got these mollusk eyes. We know it goes from simple to complex. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, do they really know all they claim that they know? In this paper, for, uh, Fernald points out that first, there's a strong suggestion that the PAC6 is autoregulatory, as are many transcription factors. Second, several additional genes have been shown to induce ectopic eyes in Drosophila. In other words, it's not just the PAC6 PAC gene that can switch on an eye development. Third, there are many animals with no eyes that nevertheless express PAC6 or its homologs. Fourth, PAC6 does not just organize eye development, but appears at numerous other expression sites. 
Taken together, these data suggest that neither PAC6 or any other gene exerts a master control of eye development across phylogeny. Genetic control of eye construction is staggeringly complex, and it seems more likely that an interactive gene network regulates development of all complex organs, including the eye. And the reason I go to such lengths to talk about this one specific issue is because it's very complex, and you've got, you've got groups that take one specific thing. It's the, it's the function of the, this gene. It's the function of that. It's the, and they build their whole view of eye evolution on it. There's no consensus. At the University of Lund in Sweden, zoologist Dan Erik Nilsson has developed models to show how a primitive eye spot could evolve through intermediate stages to become a complex human-like eye in less than half a million years. Yeah, I've been interested in eye evolution for a long time. I mean, in particular, I've been interested in the question of how long time it would take for an eye to evolve. Nielsen envisioned a sequence of stages by which a flat patch of light-sensitive cells on an animal's skin could evolve into a camera-type eye. As a first step, nature would favor any changes that made the flat patch more cup-like. Here we are again. We start with some light-sensitive cells. And if there is such a thing as a seminal paper in eye evolution, this is it. A pessimistic estimate of the time required for an eye to evolve. As I've researched this over a number of years, probably more than any other single paper, this one is referenced. This is called by many as proof of evolution. This professor has proven that eye evolution can happen, and not only that, he's proven that it can happen in less than half a million years. This is the paper that they refer you to. Here's the proof. You cannot deny evolution. It can happen in less than half a million years. And I got to thinking, that must be a really interesting paper. He must have some proof. So I read the paper a number of times. Let me show you the basis of his proof. Taking a patch of pigmented light-sensitive epithelium as the starting point, we avoid the more inaccessible problem of photoreceptor cell evolution. In other words, we're not even going to deal with how cells become photosensitive. You know, photosensitive. We're not going to deal. We're going to start with some photo. I told you we'd get to that, right? We're going to start with some photosensitive cells. That's our starting point. And to me, that's a very aggravating starting point. Because as you might well expect, it answers in Genesis, we interact with a lot of people who have a secular material view of the world. You know, we interact with a lot of evolutionists who want to talk about modification by descent. They, you know, we can prove evolution. We can prove evolution. Of course, they can't. But we interact with them. And one of the things I frequently point out is, okay, if evolution is true, how did life begin? And you know, 99% of the time, the answer I get, we don't deal with that. Evolution has nothing to do with the origin of life, and technically it doesn't. It just talks about the changes, but they say we, we can prove evolution, but we're not going to deal with the origin of life. You know why they don't want to deal with that? They have no answer to it. So we're going to start with life, and we're going to show how, how these different variations among creatures, you know, we, we're going to stack them together and say this, this is evolution, but we're not going to deal with the origin of life. Well, we're going to start here with some light-sensitive cells. We're not going to deal with how the, light, how the cells became light-sensitive. We're going to start with some light-sensitive cells. We have made such calculations by outlining a plausible sequence of alterations leading from a light-sensitive spot all the way to a fully developed lens eye. We're going to deal with a plausible sequence of alterations. Now, who determines this plausible sequence of alterations? The guy that set up the paper. Again, very convenient. We let the evolutionary sequence start with a patch of light-sensitive cells. That just keeps coming up. We assume that the patch is circular, and that selection does not alter the total width of the structure. The latter assumption is necessary to isolate the design changes from general alterations in the size of the organ. We assume the patch is circular. The development of a lens with a mathematically ideal distribution of refractive index may at first glance seem miraculous. That's the first thing he got right so far. Yes, it was indeed miraculous. Praise God. The nervous tissue and the vertebrate retina can also be ignored as this is clearly part of the nervous system, which just happens to reside in the eye. We're going to totally ignore the nervous tissue. If you go to my eye and you take out the nervous tissue, you know what my eye's worth? Nothing. 
It just waters when my cats walk by. That's it. Because if you don't connect it to something, it just happens to reside in the eye. You know what that's called? That's called proof. And based on all these things, the calculation was made that shows you start with a patch of light-sensitive cells, it gets more and more and more and more cupped, and then a lens shows up, and then a mechanism to change the, 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 the configuration of the lens. Just, do you get any genetic way this could happen? But say you set up the parameters of your analysis, you know, I, you can make it say anything you want. If we assume a generation time of one year, which is common for small and medium-sized aquatic animals, it would take less than 364,000 years for a camera eye to evolve from a light-sensitive patch. Proof. Your Bible's not true. Let's all go home. If we assume everything here is based on assumption, everything here is based on taking a set of parameters that he and his team chose they did their calculations, and this is their proof the eye can evolve in 364,000 years or less. You know, the, the problem with those who are unable to see evolution, I think, is they don't have imaginations. There is that, right? The fool has said in his, God, in his heart, there is no God. Most modern phyla can be traced back to the Cambrian explosion 530 to 520 million years ago. The fauna that appeared during the Cambrian explosion included a wealth of bilaterally symmetrical, bilaterally symmetric and mobile animals with what? Well-developed eyes. Every eye that we've shown here and all these sequences and all these, you know, the different mollusk eyes we've seen, they're all fully functional. They're not evolving from, they're functional for the creature for which they were what? Designed. At every stage of its development, the evolving eye functioned well enough to provide a selective advantage for survival. And among animals alive today, we find eyes at all these stages of development. And all of them function. Now, that's a very curious segment out of that video. We find it eyes at all stages of development, but they're all functional. You think you need to step back and say, these are all fully functional eyes? They function for the creature for which they were designed. And if you look around, just look around in nature, you see just an enormous variety. You do have creatures that have light-sensitive cells. You do have creatures that have various kinds of eyes. There's as much variety in eyes as there are of any particular physical characteristic you find in nature. It is amazing. It's incredible. But according to the evolutionists, these are all just chemical accidents that occurred over billions of years. Valerie Young's retinal tear is just one example of imperfections in the design of human eyes. Another occurs because nerve cells and blood vessels evolved to lie in front of the retina, where they interfere with its ability to form sharp images. It's like trying to take a picture through a foggy piece of glass. And the optic nerve itself evolved to connect to the brain through a hole in the retina. So the eyes of all vertebrates have a small blind spot right near the middle of the visual field. Evolution starts with what's already there, tinkers with it and modifies it, but can never do a grand redesign. So even the eye, with all of its optical perfection, has clues to the fact that its origin is of the blind process of natural selection. Another interesting thing you find when you talk to evolutionists about the eye is it, it's, it's proof of evolution because God could not have designed the eye. If God designed the eye, God's a bad engineer because, you know, the blood vessels are on the surface. Of the It'd be like looking through a foggy piece of glass. No, it's not. I can see you all very clearly. I've got blood vessels in my eye. They're there for a purpose. But this guy says, you know, evolution can't do a grand redesign. As amazing as all the perfections in the eye are, 
We can't get rid of the imperfections. Well, guess what? I want somebody to show me an imperfection. Now, as we get older, I mean, you know, we, our bodies age, and I don't see as well as I used to, and certainly people get cataracts. I mean, we live in a fallen, cursed world. But what the evolutionists say is if God designed the eye, he did it wrong. Although the human eye would be a scandal if it were the result of divine deliberation, a plausible evolutionary explanation of its absurd construction can be obtained quite easily. Absurd construction? It's one of the most marvelous things in our universe. It's one of the most complex, incredibly designed things in our world. And according to evolutionists, the eye is of absurd construction. The complexity of the human eye poses no challenge to evolution by natural selection. In fact, the eye and all of biology makes no sense without evolution. Is the human eye proof of evolution? And I can't count the number of times that I've had, you know, professors at schools or people challenge me when I speak at churches and conferences, and they've told me just that. Well, just look at the eye. The eye is proof of evolution. You know, they say, is the human retina evidence of bad design? Or, more correctly, did God put the film in backwards? Did God get it wrong? The retina has been put together backwards. Unlike the retinas of octopuses and squids, in which the light-gathering cells are aimed forward toward the source of incoming light, the photoreceptor cells of the human retina are aimed backwards, away from the light source. And you know, that's true. They are aimed away from the light source. I guess God just got it wrong. Worse yet, the nerve fibers which must carry signals from the retina to the brain must pass in front of the receptor cells, partially impeding the penetration of light to the receptors. Only a blasphemer would attribute such a situation to divine design. Folks, one of the things you can do to get on my last nerve is mock my God. God got it wrong. According to these very wise people, any engineer would naturally assume that the photocells would point towards the light with their wires leading backward towards the brain. He would laugh at any suggestion that the photocells might point away from the light with their wires departing on the side nearest the light. Yet this is exactly what happens in all vertebrate retinas. Each photocell is, in effect, wired in backwards with the wire sticking out the side nearest the light. The wire has to travel over the surface of the retina to a point where it dives through a hole in the retina, which is the so-called blind spot in the back of our eye, to join the optic nerve. This means that the light, instead of being granted an unrestricted passage through the photocells, has to pass through a forest of connecting wires, presumably suffering at least some attenuation and distortion. Probably not much, but still it's the principle of the thing that would offend any tidy-minded engineer. Here at least he says, even if it happens, you, th those nerve cells are not going to cause much distortion. So you're not necessarily looking through like a foggy piece of glass. I don't know the exact explanation of this strange state of affairs. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. This is what God got wrong. This is the human eye. It is amazing beyond my ability to, to communicate that to you. It's just incredible. In fact, uh, I did this presentation early Monday morning when I got through. There was actually an ophthalmologist that came to the talk, and he was all excited. He said, when I was in school, I saw the back of the eye. I start, started studying the retina, and I wanted to be an eye surgeon. He was so excited. He said, this is what my life's been about, dealing with this, which according to the evolutionists is really a cosmic accident. This is the left eyeball. Now, you'll notice the optic nerve coming out the bottom. The optic nerves, when they come out of the eye, kind of point inward. They kind of point towards the nose. And the light goes directly this way. And you know what the light directly hits? The most sensitive part of the retina. I mean, it's just a cosmic accident. I mean, there's no reason that should... It just, that just happened to be that way, right? So the optic disc is medial. It's, it's inward of the most sensitive part of the eye. Here's the right eye. On the right side, obviously, this is where the nose would be. You've got the fovea, which is the most sensitive part. That, that's, that's the sweet spot, if you will. And then you've got the blind spot over here, which is where the blood vessels and nerves duck towards the optic nerve. Now, this is the part I really get excited about. This is my favorite part of the whole presentation. This is the retina. This is the film, if you will, in our eye. And according to, according to the sectors, according to the evolutionists, this is in backwards. So we're going to start from the inner part of the eye. This is the, these are the optic nerve fibers. These are the things that lay on the surface of the retina. These are the, uh, the ganglia of the, uh, of the optic nerves. 
And these are what are called bipolar neurons. Now, these are all on top of the photoreceptor cells, which are here. Those are the cells that actually react to the light. That, that's where the action is in the retina, if you will. So everything above that is between the light and the receptor cells. Now, below the receptor cells, you have something called the pigment epithelium, then another amazing structure called the choroid. And then you have the sclera, which is the outer part of the eye. And the light goes this way. So the film is indeed in backwards. It looks like God got it wrong, right? Well, maybe not. The retinal pigment epithelium has complex mechanisms for dealing with toxic molecules and free radicals produced by the action of light. Specific enzymes such as superoxide dismutases, catalases, and perioxidases are present to catalyze the breakdown of potentially harmful molecules such as superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Antioxidants such as vitamin E and vitamin C are available to reduce oxidative damage. Well, let me just give you the short course in this, folks. God only, not, not God only got it right, he got it really right. You know what the metabolic rate of those, of, of those photoreceptor cells in the eyes? It's extraordinarily high. I don't know if you know people who like to use high-powered computers. You know, the gaming computers, or they're, they're, they work at a, at a place where they do a lot of graphic modeling or something. Part of the thing is they put a lot of stress on their computer processors. They have to cool those things down or the processors don't work well. If computer processors get too hot, they become very inefficient. So you have to have ways to take the heat away. Same way with our retinas. When, the ret when, the, when, when all those chemical reactions are going on in those photoreceptor cells, you know what's generated? A lot of heat. And if there's an organ in your body you don't want to heat up, I submit that if you make a list, your eyeballs are really high on that list. I can't think of one higher. I mean, I don't want my eyes to get hot. So what happens is in that choroid, you've got a lot of blood flow. You know what that blood does? It takes the heat away. Man, what an accident, right? And you know what else it does? It provides nutrition to those cells that need a lot of energy for all these chemical reactions. And when you have chemical reactions, when those things react, you know what you have? You have waste products. You know what happens with all that blood flow? It takes the waste products away. You know what else the blood does? It brings new material in so those metabolic processes can continue. Without the film being in backwards, either we'd have to have so much blood between, those, between the receptor cells and the light, you couldn't get any light through, or our eyeballs would, would, would heat up and explode. But God got it wrong. In 1980, a paper was published which explained for the first time something already known about the choroid. And that's that layer below the receptor cells. It's very high rate of blood flow, which far exceeds the nutritional needs of the retina. Despite the latter being highly active, it's remarkable for having the highest blood, blood flow per gram of tissue of all the tissues in the body. It even has a higher blood flow per gram than the, than the kidney which is also needs an extraordinary amount of blood flow to filter our blood. This is designed exquisitely. But the secular world says, no, the film's in backwards, so God's a bad designer. God got it right. So those other engineers that say God didn't get it right, you know what they are? They're wrong. This is the phobia. This, this is, the, this is the, the, the sweet spot, if you're on the retina. You'll notice... Conveniently, you don't have as many bipolar neuron cells there. Wow, that's an accident. But, you know, the light still has to go through all that tissue. So how can we see as well as we do? Well, as it turns out, there's an explanation. This is another cross-section of the retina. And there's a cell in the retina. It's called a Mueller cell. And for many years... Scientists didn't know what these cells were. They were totally baffled. Like, what do these things do? I mean, it, it's like a big funnel that, that sort of opens on the, on the surface of the retina, and it narrows, and the neck of the funnel takes, takes stuff down to the photoreceptor cells. You know what Mueller cells do? They make the retina so sensitive you can't imagine. They gather and collect all the light, and they take that light directly to the photoreceptor cells. These cells act like, optic, like fiber optic channels, guiding light to the photoreceptors. They cover a substantial portion of the surface of the retina. 
And they play a role in filtering out what's called light noise, thus keeping the images sharper. Because it's like, you know, when you tune a radio and it's not exactly on the station and you hear, you hear the sort of interference. Or like if you take pictures in very low light, sometimes you have to, you have to sort of, the, the camera does all these calculations to try to make the image, you know, visible. What this does, it actually takes out some of that noise and it makes things sharper. So not only did God get it right metabolically so these cells could work at their maximum efficiency, he provided another means to get the light to those cells in such a way that it actually sharpens the image. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. In other words, we're going to accept anything, any explanation we have to to keep God out of the picture. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And if that weren't amazing enough, it's even better than that. To simulate 10 milliseconds of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous nonlinear differential equations 100 times. It would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer. Keeping in mind there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complex ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. And that's just a cosmic accident. The human visual system cannot register motion as accurately and sensitively as that of a fly. But if it did, we'd see all the fluorescent lighting and television flickering continually. We cannot see at night as well as a cat. But we surpass it in some other ways. For example, cats have no color vision. The human eye represents an excellent balance between versatility and performance, which has enabled man's astonishing technological achievements in antiquity. The multiple aspects of eye evolution, gene sharing, convergence, homology, parallelism, all occurring simultaneously reflect the enormous richness of choices that nature provides at each instant over hundreds of millions of years under changing conditions. The ambiguities in evolutionary history that we spectators at a distance are left with resemble the literature qualities of science where the great conflicts are seldom resolved to finality. We are writing narratives about characters we never met that were born and in some cases died during events before our time and that may have had similar or quite different functions during their lifetime than their progeny have today. In other words, we know it's true. We have to believe it's true. In our worldview, it must be true. But we have no way to make it logically make sense. Our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material ex explanations, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. And here's the upshot. Moreover, materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Some claim that evolution is just a theory, as if it were merely an opinion. The theory of evolution, like the theory of gravity, it's a scientific fact. Evolution really happened. Accepting our kinship with all life on Earth is not only solid science. In my view, it's also a soaring spiritual experience. And again, I could only come up with about five lectures on that one 15-second clip. I mean, he finds it's a soaring spiritual experience that we're related to bananas. Now, I find it a soaring spiritual experience that I have a creator, 
that is so amazing. He created all these things. And we do have certain, you know, we share common characteristics with lots of creatures in our world because we have a common designer. We have common metabolic pathways. I have no problem with that. But according to Dr. Tyson here, it's a soaring spiritual experience to know that we just evolved from material things over billions of years and chemicals bumping together. And it's a soaring. I want to know what he thinks is a spiritual experience. What is spiritual to a materialist? So somebody who believes that matter is all that matters, you know, just chemicals bumping together over millions of years. What, how does he define what's spiritual? So the whole thing just makes no sense. He's inconsistent. A fool has said in his heart, there is no God. He that planted the ear shall he not hear. He that formed the eye shall he not see. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, which I think is really neat that it says clearly seen. We're talking about that. Being under, yeah, I, I, that's why I don't know, so y'all get that. Being understood for the things that are made, even his eternal power in God has, so we are without excuse. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And with that, we'll conclude. Thank y'all for coming. I hope y'all take advantage of a lot of the other lectures during Renewathon. Y'all have a wonderful rest of the day. Appreciate that very much. Will you be outside? To, to, yeah, he'll be outside to talk to you.